Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Hey everyone, welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. I am Erica Adler, shareholder and leader of the healthcare practice group at Retzel and Andrus. Today I have two amazing guests. First, I have Betsy Noxon from Drake & Co. She is a medical practice consultant and she works with practices on a variety of situations and issues, um, including hiring, resolving patient issues, implementing EMR systems, onboarding physicians, working with insurance companies, billing, inventory, et cetera. I think you get the idea. So basically she's a one-stop shop for helping physicians. Uh, today, we also have Jason Fisk, who's been with us before, and he's really my go-to guy on a lot of different issues. Jason's with PBC Advisors, and he provides accounting, tax, financial planning, and consulting services. And his clients include small and large practices of all sizes, dental, medical, surgery centers, etc. And he does a great job, and I've worked with him for many years. So thanks to both of you for being here today. And I think it's going to be a great discussion because today we're really going to be talking about an issue that's come up a lot lately. And the three of us have had the opportunity to work together several times on these matters. So what we're going to be discussing is starting a traditional or a concierge medical practice and some of the financial, legal, and operational questions to consider and also how to choose between them. So let's jump right in. And um, why don't we start with how do you start a practice? So you're working somewhere, you're thinking, hmm, I might want to leave and start my own practice. What should I do? Well, from my perspective, it's pretty easy. The first thing you want to do is really look at your contract with your current employer or practice and figure out how do you leave? Does it require a certain amount of notice? Do you have a non-compete that prevents you from going somewhere within a certain mileage? You know, is the timing good? Are you going to have to repay money? Are you going to lose a bonus? So the exit strategy is really important as well. I might mention uh, malpractice insurance. Do you have to buy a tail or not buy a tail? So this immediately raises for me an analysis of how do you leave where you're working? And I definitely work with doctors on that. But the more exciting part is starting that new practice. So Betsy, why don't we start with you? Tell us a little bit, somebody comes to you, they're thinking of leaving a practice and what is the first piece of advice that you give them? So oftentimes um, they have made that decision um, about leaving. So it's, it's timing and we kind of start with, okay, where are we at in the process? Have you found a location? Um, you know, based on the contract side of things, how are they going to exit and how, what is the ramp up time they need to actually open their doors? Usually they're working um, and seeing patients during the time that they're preparing to open their practice. So I'm that person in between to get them to that spot of opening their new practice. Um, so they need to think about their physical location, what type of practice they wanna set up, what is the, do they wanna take insurance? Do they want to have a private membership um, pool of patients? Um, are they what kind of EHR would they be staying on or launching a new one? So there's a lot of operational things um, that kind of go in line with that, you know, ramp up time before they open their doors. But what kind of schedule, what kind of lifestyle? Why are they leaving? Are they leaving their practice because they want more balance in their life? Or are they, you know, what are those reasons behind it? And what are their goals with, um, you know, their new kind of next step within their career? So those are things I discuss as well. And, you know, what are their, what are their schedule look like? So a lot of little details um, of what they envision their next career move to be. So once they come to you and they say, okay, I'm definitely going to leave. Um, they also, of course, are going to need some advice on the practical aspects. And one of the first things I always do is talk with the accountant or encourage them to talk with their accountant. Um, and so Jason, why don't you speak to how you would guide clients who inform you that they want to start their own practice? What are some of the first things they need to think about? Once they've made the decision that they're ready to start their own practice, kind of the first step of that before you can do anything, sign any contracts, sign a lease, um, get a bank loan, open a bank account is you, is you have to have an entity, right? So the first decision to make is entity structure. 
more times than not nowadays in medicine, you're either going to go, you're going to go some type of flow through entity, they call it, which would be an S corporation or an LLC or PLLC. Um, the issues there can depend on state. Um, more times than not in the past, we used to recommend LLCs, depending on income level, sometimes S corporation, it depends how many owners you eventually plan to have. S corporations are limited to 100 owners. So if you plan to grow this into a very large practice, you're kind of limited to the LLC structure. Um, and then also in Illinois, for example, where we operate, most of our clients are in Chicagoland area. There was an, uh, a pass-through entity tax bill that was passed in August of 2021. Um, that was a major consideration where some of our clients that were leaning towards the S corporation would decide now they want to be part of an LLC because there's more tax savings there. So on the accounting side, the biggest decision is what entity structure do you need and how can you get the most tax savings once you have based on the entity structure once you have that set up then you can kind of start the the true planning aspects you can sign contracts you can get a bank account you can get credit cards you can sign your lease right and some of the things you and i will work on as a result of that would be some of the entity documents so um you know, if it's a corporation, it's going to be a shareholders agreement. If it's a PLLC, it's going to be an operating agreement. And so a lot of times doctors, if they're doing it with a colleague rather than on their own, they want to jump right in and they haven't really given thought to what it's really going to look like. And some decisions have to be made. Uh, who makes the decisions about the practice? How is profit shared? What compensation policy are we using? What happens if somebody leaves or dies, et cetera. So we form the entity and then we also have to kind of go through that process. And Jason and I, you know, we always kind of work closely together because that compensation formula, understanding, you know, what's paid out as profit or distributions versus what's compensation is something that does take some time to work out. So a lot of times if doctors aren't kind of giving themselves enough time for these operational aspects, they often will have started a practice the minute they form an entity, they won't even have talked about these elements, which can lead to dispute down the road. And so I know you and I talk about these issues often. Yeah, it's really important to have a lot of back and forth between all your advisors, especially I found, you know, our relationship with you guys, but the attorney account relationship back and forth in the startup phases, especially the very beginning phases, there's a lot of back and forth, whether they come to you first or us first then you usually have to start on the accounting side and say, okay, what entity structure? Then we go back and juggle to your side and say, okay, that dictates what documents we have to get in place. But then just as you pointed out, now one of the big important factors is how do we divvy up the money, right? What's the profit formula? So while you're working on a lot of those legal documents, it's still important to have some back and forth with your other financial advisors, accountants on that side of things too, to make sure that what's written in the legal document is what the doctors intend as far as how profits are going to be split. Absolutely. And some of the things that you and I have kind of run across that sometimes come up um, is, for example, they may have be all excited about using a particular name and they've already got a logo that they want and they didn't even, you know, take the time to really research whether somebody else nearby is using that name. And so if they jump ahead and like talk to Betsy, for example, and start branding, and they haven't even thought about whether the name is legally available or talked about a trademark search, etc. That's one bump in the road. The other thing that we've come across is that sometimes the terminology that people use is, is wrong. So they want to start, for example, uh, a concierge practice, but they don't really understand what that means. And, but they call it a concierge practice. And then when you and I talk with them, we find out, oh, they really just want to share space. They don't want a concierge practice. Or they want to do what's called a concierge practice, but they want to take insurance, which is really not a pure concierge practice. So I think talking with your advisors is really important because any one of us would, when we hear these words being spoken, be able to kind of direct the client to better understand what the options are um, and to kind of guide them accordingly. The documents that we would write for one versus the other, whether it's the compensation formula, uh, whether it's how they handle their banking, uh, or even maybe the type of entity, uh, definitely the legal documents involved really depend on the choice of what they're actually talking about doing. Um, and I think sometimes clients just get very excited or they're getting advice from friends and family. And, you know, I think that's why really talking to advisors who've done this is important, but listening to them is important as well. Yeah, it's really important to listen to kind of the direction they want to go, because like you said, 
a lot of times, especially if physicians have been in, haven't been in private practice, they work for a large health system or they've just been an employee somewhere else, they may use terminology that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to them as it does us because they may be using it incorrectly or they may just have a different view of what it is. So again, there can be that misinterpretation if they're trying to do something in an email versus having a true conversation explaining what they want the process to be rather than trying to use specific words. Yeah, concierge. Well, that can be very broad, right? As you mentioned. Right, exactly. Um, and based on what they choose, it impacts almost every part of their working documents. Uh, you know, the buyout formula, the compensation formula. So it's really, it, it really matters. So if you've gone a certain direction, not realizing what the client was really trying to say, or until they realize what they really wanted, you might have to redo everything, which can be uh, kind of difficult. Um, all right, so let's talk briefly before we kind of get into detail about practices. When somebody comes to you and they say they want to do a traditional practice, I think we all understand what that means. They're going to take insurance and, and they're going to set up a kind of a standard practice. So we're going to talk about what the requirements are for that. The second type of practice is a concierge practice. A true concierge practice will not take insurance, will opt out of Medicare, and will have some kind of program where they are accepting a flat monthly fee or annual fee uh, in lieu of insurance. And that is a true concierge practice. The third type is a hybrid. A hybrid would be where you take insurance, but you also kind of collect a fee for participation. And uh, we did a prior um, podcast on this topic for those that want to go look at those legal issues a little more carefully. You can uh, definitely search that up. But the, the important thing to understand is that you can't really collect the fee for something that is covered by insurance. So you need to be very careful and strategize with people like Betsy and Jason to make sure that the things you're charging for are appropriate, that don't violate your payor contracts, um, and that you actually are re reviewing that annually to make sure that payor reimbursements or things haven't changed, you don't need to change your fees, et cetera. So I want to kind of put that out there. So let's say the client decides to go with a pure concierge practice. That means they're not taking insurance. So Betsy, they come to you and they say they want to do concierge practice. Uh, talk to me a little bit about some of the preparation that they need to think about and how it might be different from a traditional practice. So just to kind of add on to, um, you know, pure concierge, they um, patients would still need to keep their insurance um, for specialty care or if they're admitted to the hospital, if they need um, an MRI or x-ray, those types of things. So it's not that the, the patient, it, it's kind of in addition to they would buy into this membership with, um, you know, the practice. Uh, so kind of going you know, having you guys, the two of you really set up the initial, um, what their practice looks like, like is excellent for me, because then I know all of the details of, you know, the structure is taken care of, because then once I get into the bookkeeping, you know, they know how things will kind of shake out. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, you know, what you guys do is so important <laughs> so that I'm successful and they're successful in the next steps and getting to the nitty gritty. But so, yeah, if a, if a physician comes to me and they, and they say, okay, this is what we want to do. I'm ready to go. All my papers, the contracts, everything's signed. We've got the bank account. It's now, now looking at um, the, really the technology and things are so technological these days. Um, you know, communication, what are what is it going to look like for the patients when all of a sudden they hear their doctors moving and leaving? Where are they going? They're, you know, people from the patient side of it, we have to look at, um, you know, they may panic and, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my doctor. And what is it going to look like? What does concierge, what does it mean? It's fairly kind of new, uh, a new term. So it's initially kind of setting up a website, um, a landing pad to be where patients can search for their physician um, and the communication of, okay, we are gonna be here if you want us, um, we're gonna be available and this is what it's going to look like. So we time communications about what the practice, um, when it's gonna be open, when enrollment is going to be open. Um, and it's then setting up the systems of, you know, in the office, how are their messaging, their HIPAA secure messaging systems going to look like? What are their um, 
what are their, what is the enrollment in a pro, pure concierge? It's very different than, you know, in contract, um, in insurance contracts that the physician has. So how are we going to collect the patient information and push out, okay, we've got, you know, open enrollment for existing patients and we have new patients. How is that going to look? Um, the, the, there, we usually typically set up meet and greets so the doctor can meet potential new patients and face-to-face -face, and the patient will also meet the, the doctor to see if it's a good fit. What is this model looking like? Um, is it good for your lifestyle as a patient um, or is it something that's just not a good fit? And you know, how available is the doctor going to be? What are the patient needs? Um, so that's one aspect of it, that communication and between the, you know, the patient and the, and the new practice. Um, also what type of, uh, um, EHR is the doctor going to be on? Are they going to be on with the hospital system that they were previously? Or are we setting up a brand new, um, electronic medical records because they're still documenting and still communicating the patient interactions and results and orders and all of that. Um, that's similar to a traditional system, um, you know, and then referrals, you know, the patient, we have to decide what type of EHR they're going to be on. And that needs to all be set up the hardware, software, what's it going to look like um, in the practice. So those types of things, getting onto the QuickBooks, um, you know, once you're starting to get monthly subscriptions for the enrollment, for the um, phones and secure messaging systems, we need to, and then QuickBooks, if that's the system they want to be on for bookkeeping, um, we need to get all of those on, you know, the into the bookkeeping aspect of it and making sure that the day-to-day -day expenses and income is tracked. Um, so that's part of it as well. And then one of the larger aspects, it's just really on physicians' mind when they first come to me is um, hiring. Who are we going to have for staff? Who is their support staff? And what does that want to, what do they want that to look like? Do they want a business manager, an office manager, um, a nurse, a medical assistant? What kind of um, support system for the communication, for messaging, for prescription refills, for testing, and that type of thing? It's a huge component. What's the face? Who's going to be the face of their practice to greet these patients? Um, to set the tone, um, to make it more of like a family atmosphere, which I think concierge is what, you know, that family um, open communication type of uh, ambiance is what the doctor's kind of looking for. So it's, that's a huge question is how, which when they're with a larger hospital system or a multi-specialty practice, it's all behind the scenes. So they're a little nervous about that. How does that look? Because now the doctors are the boss. They're the, the one in charge and they're ultimately overseeing their staff. So there's a lot of education that I do as far as the hiring or culture, what type of um, qualifications. I go through job descriptions. I do the interviewing and screening um, and then onboarding as far as you know human resources. Um, what type of uh, benefits are you gonna offer? So, and I have resources for that. Like, are you offering health insurance, a 401k plan? Um, this is what I, I, employees are sorry, looking sorry, for. Interject there too and say, say that at that point, when you get to there, you know, right around the time I start hearing the doctors say, oh, now we're talking, <laughs> you know, we're getting our health insurance, we're getting our disability insurance, whatever the benefits are is also kind of the perfect time where, again, it kind of brings in the intertwining relationship with all of us where I say, okay, we need to get a retirement plan in place because to hire some of those qualified employees, you want to be, competitive in the market, right? Are you, if employees yes. are coming from larger practices or if they're coming from a health system, they had probably had rich benefits, you wanna make sure you can remain competitive. In the benefits side, again, you have your contacts, I'm sure you reach out to, but at that point, my ears kind of light up and I say, right. let's get a retirement plan in place and let's make sure it's set up well for the owners and also something competitive for the employees. Yes, yeah, definitely the owners wanna take advantage of that. There's a lot of perks to owning your own, there's risks and then there's the perks to owning your own business. And that's something that they may not be aware of having just been an employee on a, on a hospital system. So definitely that's a bonus to be able to have your own 401k plan and those um, retirement options for you. But yeah, so that's great. That's yes. And that, and that's a lot of what, um, you know, the staff is looking for, what, it, what's, 
because that's they're shopping around, they're interviewing, they're finding out what what's a good fit for them. And um, so the benefits, health and um, insurance, that type of thing. And then also, what does the schedule look like? Um, a lot of them are like, is this, am I be working weekends, holidays, all of that? Usually concierge, they want to, the doctors want a little more control of their schedule and they want to say, okay, I want, you know, a couple of weeks off in the summer to be with my family or holidays off. So that's a, a question that comes up and it's something that doctors really need to look at, you know, what, what is their overall year look like? And that probably goes into what you talk about, Jason, as far as that, um, you know, how many patients do they need to see to make a profit and how, you know, what is, what is their volume? And so that's something too, that we also discuss is, is like how many patients in their panel do they each want? And I've talked to one person in the practice may want to stay pretty busy while the other one may kind of want to, want to wind down or is really looking to back off of a, a high volume practice. Right. And, and, let me and then just with that, with the thing. volumes too, then you have to get into based upon their volumes, based upon the type of practice doing concierge, or if they're a, more of a, a typical right. medical practice, you have to help them determine, again, based on their weeks they went off, how to budget the, the cash flow of the practice, right? The working capital that they have. Yes. In a typical practice where revenue comes in consistently throughout the year, you know, you can afford to take bonuses maybe more frequently as, as from your profit, from, from your profits, right? Um, but in a concierge practice where you have maybe an annual enrollment and it's maybe it's a one time, you know, March 1st of every single year, it gets a little more tricky because you have to leave more cash in your practice to cover overhead for the next 11 months before your next annual enrollment. So the budgeting gets a little trickier in a concierge practice too. And you, you can't think about it as a, a typical practice owner where you say, well, whatever is available at the end of the quarter, I'm just going to take as a bonus because more money is going to continue to, to flow it. That's a great point. Right. And also if you're a if you're hybrid, right, that same thing applies. You've got your traditional insurance, but then you've got those participation payments coming in maybe once a year, maybe not. So you can't allocate yet what you don't have, especially if you're depending mm -hmm. on that as part of your, uh, you know, your revenue. You know, one thing I just want to mention is, and we're not really going to go into detail here, but for all of these practices, um, you do need legal type paperwork, contracts with your patients, opting out of Medicare, yes. Et cetera. So we're not going to go into detail, but that's one of the things that, you know, we would point out to any client doing uh, a concierge or a hybrid concierge practice that you can't just, you know, take the money or just make a little contract up on a piece of paper. We are looking to protect everybody by uh, having a particular schedule. What happens if a patient leaves mid-year? What happens if a patient dies? Um, you know, what, who refunds that money? What if you've already spent it? You know, so those are the kind of things that particularly you, Betsy and Jason would really be working out kind of financially in advance, um, but then we write it down. So there's a, a plan in place uh, on how that gets handled. So I, we're, we're kind of skimming over that. I want people to know that isn't a legal issue to be dealt with. And Jason, one other thing I kind of want you to mention, I, I love your point there. How does that annual fee or quarterly fee affect a normal compensation arrangement uh, or a buyout, uh, a severance package? You know, typically in a traditional practice, you've got accounts receivable coming in, right? Often we use a buyout formula uh, that's a combination of hard assets, maybe some accounts receivable. But when, when all you've got is these annual or quarterly payments, and that's the entire revenue, you know, how hard is it to kind of guide the clients in terms of coming up with a document based on those kinds of parameters? In a more typical practice, you know, when a new physician comes in or they typically buy their own accounts receivable, um, and then they start getting credit for those receipts within whatever the profit formula is for that practice. And then when they get bought out, whatever accounts receivable are as of their last day of employment, they typically get the estimated collectible amount of those accounts receivable also, or you know, if it's spread out over 12 months, you might get the actual accounts receivable coming in. In concierge practices with the kind of one-time annual enrollment and one-time annual renewal fee, you know, they're basically prepaying for that year of service. So more times than not, there's not accounts receivable. Maybe you have a little bit of bad debt there where there's people who haven't paid and, you, and they've been long-time patients and you're continuing to see them. So, there's, so they may owe you their last annual fee. Um, but the buyouts are much less significant typically in concierge practices on the accounts receivable side because there usually is very little, if any. 
Um, however, on the concierge side, one of the arguments you can make is that there's more goodwill to be associated with that practice, right? In the old days when medical practices sold, there was almost always some form of goodwill attached. You know, the goodwill I, I built up with my patients, the name brand I've created. More and more so nowadays, there's less attached to goodwill unless you're selling to, you know, a private equity group or even a health system, but signed an indiv individual physician, there's oftentimes not a lot of goodwill attached. Um, in concierge practices, the vast majority of the value to a practice probably is the goodwill, right? It's the relationship that that concierge doctor has built with the patient. And if Betsy's one of the physicians at the concierge practice, and and I've been a patient of hers for 10 years, and she tells me, well, I should go to the new physician, Erica, because Betsy's retiring, I'm probably going to trust her, right? That, that There's definitely a value to that. Um, and I again, I think that's more so in concierge practices than, than typical medical practices nowadays. Right. So you have to come up with more of a unique formula. Is one of the concierge doctors going to want to buy out their partners when their panel's already full? You know, that looks a little bit different than in a typical practice where you probably would buy out your partner and just bring in an associate to work those patients, right? There's a lot of variations on, on this concierge approach that we don't see in the traditional document, which is why it's so important to kind of talk through those. For a new associate nuances. coming in, you know, there's different ways you can structure, but if I'm the new associate coming in and Betsy's retiring, am, am I going to be willing to pay for patients that might not stay? Right? Is there going to be a retention element to that based on how many okay. patients stay potentially that goodwill could be valued on? And there's a lot of, I won't say there's one the right way, but there's a lot of different ways and they're usually more creative in concierge practices for buy-ins and buy-outs than they are in typical practices. Right. So we really need to talk through those. And one other thing I'll mention is that, and Betsy, you would probably know this, but we were seeing like five or seven year leases uh, with accompanying build out for doctors that are starting new concierge practices. And a lot of times the doctors who I see starting these practices, not always, some of them just kind of choose that as their career direction. But a lot of times I'm seeing it at uh, physicians who are later on in their career. So they want to practice for seven more years, 10 more years. I have some ob that might be doing like menopause only concierge practices. So sometimes this is used as an exit strategy for physicians that maybe have been employed in a hospital system, so they don't really have anything to sell to private equity, let's say, but they want their own exit strategy. And I see this as being, uh, you know, a very popular approach. Do you see that happening as well? Um, does it affect kind of any of the guidance that either one of you would give as a result? Um, yes, I have seen it. The people I've worked with is they've been more on like the end of their like the 10 to seven year range because you know coming out of medical school it's it's intimidating to think okay I got to start new it's overwhelming you know how am I gonna I know nothing about starting a practice and they're competing with all these larger entities so what what I'm seeing now is yeah the the physicians are either maybe mid career maybe twelve they've been working twelve years or fifteen twenty years and they're thinking. I need a shift. This isn't sustainable. The expectations, um, it's not how I want to practice medicine. Um, you know, there's just a lot of the, the regard for physicians in some of these large hospitals has shifted over the years. And they want to be in charge of their own, um, the time that they spend with patients, kind of get back to the meaning of medicine, of what they've, they got into it for. So they're looking for more of a balance in their life and a shift. And so, um, so yes, it, they're looking for kind of for, you know, their mid or end of career type of things, what I've seen. I mean, the younger physicians just out of residency, or, you know, they're usually more fearful of the risk they're taking on by starting their own practice, especially when they don't know how fast collections are going to ramp up. There's no track right. record. They need right. to make money right away, right? Or they want to make money right away. What I've seen is that those physicians that typically want to start their own practice out of residency, usually they want to buy a practice that's established or, you know, a physician that's retiring and take over because they do see a track record and they know that while there may be a buy-in associated with that, that could be significant. At least there's a track record and they know what they can expect from a, an income standpoint, right? Starting concierge, you don't know how fast you're going to ramp up, how many patients you're going to get, and it can take longer. So in that style of practice, I'd agree with you guys, you typically see the people at least 10, 12, 15 years into a career or towards the end of their career because they're more financially stable. They have a little bit more of a nest egg. They can afford to take longer to ramp up. Absolutely. And how do you feel though about this long-term 
lease commitment, though, if somebody is towards the end of their career. I mean, I, I guess with any new practice, you're probably doing a lease commitment here. Um, I just kind of feel like where people use this as an exit strategy with potentially an end date, they don't always talk about bringing in new partners. It's often just like, this is what we're going to do for the next X amount of years. So I always kind of worry about what happens if it doesn't work out or one of them leaves. They've got this commitment here. And, um, you know, the other partner doesn't always want or can't pick up those other patients. And, you know, you, you may not have luck finding somebody who the patients like or who want to kind of step into that role. Do you think there's any more risk here from that perspective or is it just about the same? I think it's harder with kind of shares practices to find a replacement or, or a, a new partner coming in. So I, I think it does bring some added risk to that element of the lease, right? In a typical practice, you, you usually see a fairly smooth transition or growth where you're adding new associates and eventually buyouts of partners that are kind of the senior partners. Um, that's pretty common, but in concierge practice, there it doesn't seem like there is as smooth of a transition because of the fact you can't share patients, right? It's the one patient calls, they have their relationship with Betsy, they want to see Betsy, right? They're not going to come to Jason. So it adds some risk to signing that long-term lease with how would a transition go over if Betsy retires. And so often in the documents, we need to say, yeah, you can leave, but you're still on the hook for that lease, mm -hmm. right? Which is something that they really need to talk about before they do the deal. So, uh, you know, if, you know, maybe the practice itself is somehow they got someone in to pick up some of those patients and they're covering some of that overhead, but otherwise they're personally responsible for that. That's something I always want to see in the documents, uh, you know, if I'm representing the entity, because, you know, I'm not advocating for one or the other, it's got to be fair. Right. Um, so it is a little bit of a risky situation, a lot of potential upside, but some different kind well, of. Well, if there's a lot of concern there with the lease, too, maybe we think that I'm only going to practice for five years. You might have to go in with your lease negotiation, knowing that you may have to pay a larger monthly rent mm -hmm. because you want a shorter term. Right. I mean, the, the, yeah. the landlord typically wants a 10 year lease, and the tenant usually wants the five year lease, a shorter lease. Right. So the only way to kind of negotiate that may be you have to slightly overpay based on what you should be paying so you can get that shorter lease, which while you may be overpaying in the present, it may save you in the long term if I plan on retiring in five years. Right. Betsy, do you see landlords willing to do five-year leases? I know a lot of banks loaning money for build-outs want to see at least five years, but I've heard of some of them looking for longer even. What do you, what do you yeah. see? Um, to be honest, I don't see a lot of the leases. I kind of come in after that that aspect. So Jason probably sees more of that. Both of you do. Um, but I would recommend, you know, definitely that they should be thinking about all of that. And, and, you know, actually prior to, you know, at least two years before they would want to retire, start exploring, you know, and networking with other physicians who may want to, I mean, you're not going to just say, okay, next month I'm going to retire. There's got to be a succession plan. So, um, you know, that would, that would obviously make sense as to, you know, and maybe get advice from a consultant or an expert on that succession plan and what that's going to look like. And so keep your, you know, keep those, keep your eyes open within like, you know, two to three years of your retirement, you know, of, you know, maybe bringing somebody on board and, mm. and uh, establishing those relationships within the community, within your, with your colleagues. Okay. So one last issue I want to bring up, I think we've really kind of talked about so many things here and only because this question I get asked this quite often, is when you go to a concierge practice and you're paying out of pocket, can you submit those bills to your HSA? Um, and it is not always an easy answer. Um, I was hoping maybe, Jason, you could tell us your thoughts on this or you know, at least who people should be asking about uh, before they start their practice so that they kind of can get the guidance on this. Yeah, and there's a lot of confusion around that, a lot of different opinions on it. Um, the fact of the matter is from an HSA, you can reimburse things that are for medical care that's not reimbursed by an insurance. So I read one really good article that, you know, we're talking about the hybrid concierge practice, those that do credential with the payers, but also charge the concierge fee, the membership fee, right? One good article I read um, said that they, they looked at that as paying a cover charge and a bar bill. Right. So your cover charge, if I take a client on entertainment's not deductible, right? I can't, I can't deduct the cover charge. I mean, I can't pay it with my HSA. But the bar bill, the food and the drink, I can deduct that 
because that truly is your your medical care that you're receiving, right? So the the access fee, the membership is something that you wouldn't be able to deduct, but the true medical care you're receiving, if it's out of pocket, you can deduct from an HSA. Where you have to be careful with there um, is what happens if you're just paying for the membership fee and there's nothing listed for services, right? How does an individual taxpayer substantiate the claim that this is for qualifying medical expense if they just get one invoice from a practice that says this is your annual membership fee? It doesn't specifically state that you're getting that you're getting medical services. And then the other area that you have to look at with with that, if you're just getting the one bill, is do you still have the other medical? Does an individual taxpayer still have another form of health insurance? Betsy mentioned you should still keep your medical insurance because you have to see a specialist, right? Well, if you have a true concierge practice and all you're doing is retainer medicine, right? You're charging one fee. Well, there is no deductible then, right? In order to have an HSA and fund an HSA, you have to be in a qualifying plan that has a high deductible. Well, if you drop all your insurance, and the only thing you have is your concierge fee that you're paying that covers all your medical service, there is no deductible. Therefore, you can't fund an HSA. So there's kind of two questions you have to ask. Am I in a plan first that allows me to fund an HSA? And then if I'm in a plan that allows me to fund an HSA or I have an existing HSA, what can I pay with that HSA? Can't pay the membership, but you can pay for the service. Right, so it's kind of a complex question. You have to individual by individual situation. What what plans do they already have, and what are they getting from the practice that they're paying for? Right, and then so what we do often is talk to practices whose patients are like, "I need something to turn into my HSA." So what do we do? Do we come up with a bill related to a particular date of service and the fees? But then how do we work out what the fees are when there really are no fees? It's just one fee covers everything, and so this is something that doctors really need to think about to work with their accountant and their practice manager like Betsy to kind of come up with a solution. You're going to be asked this by patients and you need to be prepared to either have a solution to say we don't do it or you know some other type of response. What I often do with our practices is come up with a Q&A list to hand out to patients when they first sign up, which you know answers a variety of questions. And often we will put something like this on the list. So if the practice is saying we do not provide any kind of receipt for HSA, that'll be the answer on that Q&A. Because yeah, as, as a physician, you don't want to be giving financial advice and tax advice right. to the, all your patients coming in, but you at least right. want, because, and again, it is an individual patient by individual patient scenario, right. and it also depends on what service you're providing. So there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And again, a doctor doesn't want to be sitting there being the financial advisor for an individual patient. Right. You can right. tell them what your invoices will say, what will be included, and then that individual is going to have right. to talk with their tax advisor and determine if they believe that the fee that they're paying is qualified. Yeah, it's true, right? most, yeah. most doctors want to help their patients. So if the patient comes yeah. in and says, I need yeah. something, yeah, you, you doctors have as much like, we'll come something up for them, right? Yeah. Definitely. And you'll probably, doctors. sorry, you'll probably need codes, I would think, um, diagnostic codes and service level codes. You know, is this an extended visit? What are they being seen for? Are they diabetic? What's the diagnosis? So it's usually just not a bill. They need to say, you know, okay, what what were they actually seen for? And are there patient notes? And that does open up a lot of um, work for maybe the business manager and the physician and a lot of back and forth. And so I think that's a great idea. Like Erica, what you said, you need to be prepared for the questions up front and how you're going to answer. And we need to communicate that and policies and procedures, which I do a lot of. And again, the policies and procedures, like you mentioned way back about financial policies and HIPAA and all of that stuff, that is, we try to be pretty heavy on that up front. So you, you mitigate issues down the road. Um, and this is just one of them, one of the policies. How do you handle this situation? And employers are in the mix because maybe people have insurance through their employer. So that's, you know, that's another party to consider and what documentation do they need to submit it to the HSA? So I think, yes, a definite mm -hmm. thing to discuss up front when we, I, lock, I, before we open our doors. I find HSA is like so frustrating myself. Like <laughs> submitting stuff makes me crazy. Uh, but something to think about. I mean, I think the right answer is to say we don't give you anything for HSA. It's only like, especially for the smaller plans, like what, 3,000 right. something. I mean, they can come up with prescriptions and other stuff like that. Right to turn in, right. uh, but the practice to have to bend over backwards and right. struggle with this is really, uh, you know, just a lot for them to, have to deal with. And I think yeah. they may be wrong and now they deal with it and may get right. 
the trouble because of it. And I don't right. want that. So I think it's best maybe just to, to say our answer is we do not provide you anything else other than our annual bill. You can see what your HSA plan says about it. That's it. That's all, you know, yeah. so, yes. but so many doctors want, especially concierge doctors want to be so helpful right. about everything. And I think sometimes they just have to be business-like about it instead. Yes. And that's what we really determine up front. These things they're just not aware of, you know, starting the new practice, these questions come up. And it's one thing I really help help them with is to foresee some of these things that were prepared, you know, even six months down the road, three months or four months after they've been open, these issues that kind of pop up, which um, they'll be prepared for. So it's huge. Right. That's a great comment there, Betsy. I mean, I, I know Eric and I have some mutual clients we worked on too, where that's come up where they say, oh no, we don't need to address that in our operating agreement, our shareholders agreement, right? <laughs> well, you may not think you do, but let's, right. you know, plan, let's hope for the best plan for the worst. What if it comes up? Let's make sure it's addressed. Let's make sure you've thought about it. Let's make sure it's documented how we would handle it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, if only everybody listened to us, right? <laughs> <laughs> you've seen it all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So any final thoughts on this topic from either one of you? I think we've kind of exhausted it, although we could keep going on and on and on, but I think we've covered the highlights. Yeah, I mean, one thing, one thing I, huge thing I do too that, um, that just recently came up is, okay, when you've got an empty office space, how are we gonna fill it? You know, we need to plan, there are contracts and vendors and there's lead time to think about, you know, getting exam tables, getting blood pressure cuffs. Doctors kind of before they leave their practice should look around and say, what am I using a lot? You know, how much do I use gauze? Do I use little stuff that goes from the big things to the little things? And then what's the lead time now, especially with some of the, there's still some hangover from, you know, getting lumber, or, you know, ordering things. There is some lead time I'm finding that the, the doctors need to think, let's do this now and not last minute. There's, we really isn't a lot of things we need to do last minute. So getting those, you know, and that's a good ahead. point because your contract may require 90 days notice to leave, but you may need six months right. to be ready to leave. So looking right. at that, kind of talking to everybody involved to kind of make sure that you aren't like unemployed for a few months because you gave notice too soon or something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, hopefully all the points that we've made is enough to get people's head swimming to say, I want to make sure I start early <laughs> enough. Right. I want to make sure I give the six months right. rather than two months and we're throwing this together. Right. There, exactly. There's a lot that goes into it that you want to make sure you have more than enough time to plan right. for. Even if you're, even if you're ready to open your doors 30 days before you thought that's a great problem to have. Let's not be, you know, opening the doors and not be finished setting the structure of our and foundation of our practice. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks both of you. This is great advice. And anybody listening, if you have any questions about anything, you can reach out to myself, Jason, Betsy. We're happy to answer your questions and we'll post the information when this uh, podcast gets posted. But thank you both for joining me on the Health Law Hotspot. And if you want to hear other podcasts that we put out, you can go to ralaw.com and we hope you will. And we also hope you'll join us next time. Thanks so much. Podcasts that we put out, you can go to ralaw.com and we hope you will and we also hope you'll join us next time thanks so much thank you that we put out you can go to ralaw.com and we hope you will and we also hope you'll join us next time thanks so much thank you that we put out you can go to ralaw.com and we hope you will and we also hope you'll join us next time thanks so much